And that's to define a small twig, a branch, as the next verse tells us, a stem that will come out from Jesse. Now, who was Jesse? Jesse was the father of King David. So out from his lineage, there is going to come somebody. He is called a branch. And it shall, and it says it will grow. This branch shall grow out of his roots. And not only that, but there is some special anointing about this branch. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, or in a sense, remain upon him. It will rest on him and stay there. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Who would this branch, of course, be? Well, this is the awakening of Christmas. What do we mean by the word awakening? Well, awakening is the realization and act of a moment of suddenly becoming aware of something, aware of something, or in our case, of someone. This is the awakening of Christmas. The sudden realization and to be in the point of awareness to what has God been saying. So here in verse 1, it tells us from the offspring of a man by the name of Jesse, who is symbolized by a stem, or we could say a stump of a tree. The tree is going to be cut down. John Walker's got his chainsaws out and he's got busy at cutting down some trees and one of them just happens to be Israel. Imagine that. This is what is pictured here of Israel as a tree and it's going to be cut down. God is going to allow it to happen to his people because he needs to do a work in there. He needs to do a work in this nation. But the stump after what has been cut down, the leftover, is Jesse. It represents a lineage, a family tree. And the good news is that although the tree has been cut down, the tree trunk stump, however big it might be, is still left. And that stump of a tree, its roots are still intact. It hasn't been cleaned out of the ground altogether. There is something left. And God is saying a branch is going to grow. A branch is going to grow out from the stump of the lineage of Jesse. Christmas is this awakening and sudden realization of this prophecy. Of this prophecy of Isaiah. The branch, of course, of Jesse is, of course, Jesus Christ. Oh, but hang on a minute. It doesn't say it's Jesus Christ. And because it's Jesse, well, it's David. David is, of course, he's the natural offspring of Jesse. No, not the Messiah. Not, you're looking in too much. You're looking too much into this. That's what the Jews have been saying for centuries. You see, the Jews come the birth of Jesus Christ and come even to the modern day Israel today. They have rejected any notion that a Mary and a Joseph who, who say what? Who? But you know what's something interesting? Although the Jews, the Israelites, may not want to acknowledge a Mary and Joseph, Jesse they can't ignore. They know Jesse. They know that Jesse is the father of King David. Jesse goes back into the, into the book of Ruth. Ruth and Boaz. Their son, they had Obed. Obed grew up and he had a son and that was Jesse. 
Jesse grew up and the son it was David. The Jews can't ignore Jesse as much as they want to reject Jesus. But here's a great little bonus this morning. A little bit of two cents advice. If you ever have the opportunity to witness to a Jew, an Israelite, an Orthodox Jew who is not Messianic, doesn't believe in the Messiah, before you start introducing Jesus, here's a little good strategy. Talk about Jesse. Remember Isaiah 11, 1, 1, 1. That's your emergency phone number. That's the emergency verse to go to if you're going to talk to a Jew. Bring up the topic of Jesse. Ask them this. Who is this Jesse? And from there you'll be able to launch into Jesus. But like I said, it's not a Jesus. We're looking too much into this. Of course we know the offspring, the stem that's going to come forth of Jesse. It must be David. No, here's the thing. David is already well and truly dead. He's, he's history. He's gone. It's not talking about King David. It's got to be talking about somebody else. And of course this is the opportunity that we introduce Jesus. This is the awakening of Christmas. This is the realization, the sudden awareness of what the Isaiah, Isaiah the prophet was saying centuries earlier than Jesus Christ. The awakening here is that Jesus Christ is the branch. He is the stem of Jesse and he is anointed fully by the Holy Spirit. Indeed he needs to be because he is the Christ. So with that in mind, with knowing that awakening is marvellous in all its grandeur and what it does, building up to awakening, we come to our first point, there is anticipation. So knowing that verse 1 and 2 of Isaiah 11, Isaiah has prophesied that out of Jesse somebody special is going to come. In Israel's darkest hour, the hour which they have almost, not Israel, it's really technically it's Judah, it's the southern provinces of Israel. The northern kingdom, the kingdom of Israel had been split north and north and south, but it's another time. But the darkest hour of Judah and Jerusalem invaded, humiliated, destroyed, and all that kind of thing, taken back to Babylon. The anticipation here that although this is going to happen to you, Judah, there is something to anticipate. God is going to do something, and it's going to involve the Spirit of God upon a particular person. They don't know who it is yet, but even from the days of Moses, it was told the Israelites that someone is coming. Someone is coming. You know what it's like. Think about anticipation. What do we think about when it's anticipating? We are anticipating something we are expecting. We are in the sense of waiting. You know what it's like when you have to wait for something or someone. Who likes to wait? Any, anyone? <laughs> you, don't be shy. Why is no hands going up? You know why? Because waiting has gone out of fashion in our modern day worlds. But there's one good thing that God knows in all his wisdom. He knows how to use waiting. Because waiting creates anticipation. I guarantee you this morning, with almost a hundred percent guarantee, almost, I could be wrong by about one or two percent, but each and every one of us this morning is waiting for something in your life. True or false? It's true, isn't it? There'll be something that you and I were all waiting for, something. We haven't, we, we were expecting it, we can anticipate it, we know it's just, maybe it's just beyond the, the border, maybe it's just beyond the horizon, we can visualize it in our mind, but we are waiting. There's something that we'll all be waiting for. 
God is good at using waiting. Because you know what waiting also tests? Who said it? Faith. That's right. Waiting tests and creates our faith. Little wonder Jesus Christ said when he talked about the end of time or the end of this age. He says, when the Son of Man returns, shall he find faith on the earth? Will he find it? That's what he was asking 2,000 years ago. Boy, we are, we are late in time. We are deep into the timeline of God, 2,000 years on. Will he find faith? Will he find people waiting with expectation when he comes? I hope it includes you and I. We will be waiting. But this is what anticipation does. There is an expectation. As a parent now, I'm talking to parents now, don't you love Christmas parents? Those of you who are children? You know what? Christmas is great because it creates an opportunity to teach our children to wait. Oh, Daddy, Mummy, can, can we open one now? About a month before Christmas. <laughs> Two weeks later. Mummy, Daddy, can, can we open one now? No, you have to wait. Daddy, Mummy, I don't like waiting. I know. That's why we're doing this. It's a great opportunity. Oh. I'm sure there's gifts and presents that you would like to open in your life. They were here right now, but you have to wait. Because they haven't got here yet. But the expectation is there, isn't it? We are all waiting to open something in our life. You know what faith also is such a great... And let's, let's move on. We've gone from anticipation. We've gone from the expectation. We've known now how God is good at using and in His wisdom using us, using waiting. And waiting creates faith or it tests our faith and it should build our faith. Is this a good thing or a bad thing? Well, this is a godly thing, so it's got to be a good thing. Do you know what faith then makes us do when we are waiting for something? What happens next? Oh, we learn how to get down on our knees and pray. Oh, gee, God's so clever. Oh, he knows how to get you on your knees. He knows how to get me on my knees. Wow, the anticipation. I want to look for a moment. Hold your place there, but go to, to Luke 22. Uh, sorry, 2.25. And I'll quickly read it. But here we have a wonderful God example in Israel, in Jerusalem, of a couple of godly people who knew how to wait for the Lord. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was just and devout, waiting, waiting, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen Lord's Christ. What an amazing man. This man was waiting to die. He was waiting to go to heaven. But God promised him he would not leave this earth until he had seen the consolation of Israel. That's another term for the Messiah. He was waiting to see the Christ. So he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents, that's Mary and Joseph, brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace. This man couldn't wait to get out of here. Mission accomplished. I've seen the Christ. I can go. Praise the Lord. According to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to bring revelation to the Jews, no, the Gentiles, and the glory of your people Israel. 
And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken by him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel. And for a sign which will be spoken against, yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also, and that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Wow. What a man who was waiting on the Lord. Verse 36, now there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was of great age and had lived with her husband seven years from her virginity. And this woman was a widow of about 84 years, who did not depart from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. Do you think this woman was a woman of faith? Do you think this woman knew about expecting things from God? Praise the Lord for godly woman. You know, godly woman, today in the church, let me just give you an encouragement, woman. You don't have to be like a man to be great. There is this common thing in cultures today that women are second class to men. I tell you this, the church doesn't need more godly women who want to be men. Let godly men be men and let godly women be women. Just accept and be thankful in who you are and be all that you can be in God, as a woman of God. Amen. Praise the Lord for somebody like Anna. Amen. Prayers night and day, and coming in that instant, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of Him to all those who looked for the redemption in Israel. Anticipation. At least there were a couple people a godly man and a woman that we read of that were waiting on the Lord. Anticipation. Expecting. Waiting by faith and being in prayer. Faithfully serving God as they ought to while they waited. Whatever you are waiting for in your life this morning, whatever you see just over the horizon that you are looking forward to, can you and I, can we wait patiently and faithfully serve the Lord until it happens? That's the big test. Because all too often, our patience runs out, we get into a bit of a mood, and we lose our patience and say, why aren't things happening fast enough? I mean, we've got instant noodles and instant finance and instant internet. Why can't this be instant also, Lord? That is it. Waiting. Being prepared to wait. Waiting is a good thing. You don't have to rush in. God doesn't rush in. He allows time. And he does things. He is working at all the time. Anticipation of Christmas. Anna and Simi were looking forward to the true Christmas. And they served the Lord faithfully while they were waiting. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 5. Let's move on. Genesis chapter 5, let's build some more anticipation. Because you know with anticipation and expectation, builds hype. Don't you love hype? Isn't that what Christmas is all about? Hype? I mean, Christmas these days, it seems to start in October with retail shops starting announcing Christmas specials. And you got again, we've got limited to su supply, don't miss out. This price won't last forever. Get in when you can. It's October. And they're already thinking about Christmas. Because the building, the hype, the expectation is there. Don't have to wait for Christmas specials. You can start in November. Oh, brilliant. Big business. 
big businesses this Christmas, this anticipation, people who know how to use it very skillfully in the world. Genesis chapter 5, I'm going to have to read this quite quickly, follow along. This is the book of genealogy of Adam, the genealogy of Adam. In the day that God created man, he made them in all the likeness of God, in the likeness of God. He created them male and female and blessed them and called them mankind in the day they were created. And Adam lived 130 years and begot a son in his own likeness after his image and named him Seth. After he begot Seth, the days of Adam were 800 years, and he had sons and daughters. So all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. I'm not surprised, it's a long time. Seth lived 105 years and begot Enosh. After he begot Enosh, Seth lived 807 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Seth were 912 years, and he died. Enosh lived 90 years and begot Canaan, or Kenan. After he begot Kenan, Enosh lived 815 years and had sons and daughters. You know, if you live to that long, you hope they've got a good retirement plan, right? So all the days of Enosh were 905 years and he died. Kenan lived 70 years and begot Mahalalel. After he begot, uh, begot Mahalalel, Kenan lived 840 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Kenan were 910 years and he died. Mahalalel lived 65 years and begot Jared. After he begot Jared, Mahalalel lived 830 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Mahalalel were 895 years and he died. Jared lived 162 years and begot Enoch. After he begot Enoch, Jared lived, Jared lived 800 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Jared were 962 years and he died. Enoch lived 65 years and begot Methuselah. After he begot Methuselah, Enoch walked with God. 300 years and his sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years. And Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. Here's one example where somebody gets raptured. He doesn't see death. He is taken by the Lord as he is. Methuselah lived 187 years and begot Lamech. And he begot, after he begot Lamech, Methuselah lived 782 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Methuselah were 969 years and he died. He's the longest man that ever lived in the Bible. Lamech lived 182 years and had a son. He's having a family a bit late. And he called his name Noah, saying, This one will comfort us concerning our work and the toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord has cursed. Back to the sin of Adam and Eve. And he begot Noah. The men lived 595 years and he had sons and daughters. So all the days of the men were 777 years and he died. And Noah was 500 years old and Noah begot Shem, Ham and Japheth. It's just a genealogy. The family tree, the descendants of Adam. There are 10 heads of state, if you like, 10 heads of family. Just one chapter, Genesis 5, dedicated to the line of Adam. Doesn't that chapter create great anticipation? Aren't you excited by this one chapter, five, a family tree? I can see it on your face, just how amazed you are. <laughs> you're trying to hide it, Louis, I know. But you're excited, right? You are. Now, let me show you what's really going on in this chapter. Adam means man. Seth means appointed. Enosh means mortal. Kenan means sorrow. Mahalalel means the blessed of God. Jared means shall come down. Enoch means teaching. Methuselah means his death shall bring. He was the sign uh, until he would die that the flood would not come. But when he died, that's when the flood came. Lamech means the despairing. Noah means 
comfort and rest. If you can read Hebrew and you had a Hebrew text, this would be easy and obvious. But for us who are mostly reading English, it's not so obvious what's really going on. But here's the anticipation. Let's put all the meanings of these names into a, a coherent sentence. Read it from the top. Man appointed mortal sorrow, the blessed God shall come down teaching, his death shall bring the despairing comfort and rest. That's the expectation of God. That's the anticipation that's been created by just chapter 5 of Genesis. A genealogy. How did God do that? I don't know. He's God and I'm not. But he could do it. He gave the message of the gospel. He gave the Israelites, he gave the lineage of Adam and to Abraham and everybody after him. Any Bible student who's doing BTC in, in the Hebrew 2,000 years ago or however how long, doing a study of Genesis, reading those names in Hebrew, could easily just put one and one together. And you would see the anticipation, the expectation that God shall come down. Emmanuel, God with us. Are you being awakened this morning? Are you seeing the realization? Are you suddenly aware of what God had already told well in advance of the gospel message? It doesn't just say, and if we put him into a sentence, he's going to come down, but it says his death. God is going to come down and die. For what? To help those that are in mortal sorrow, the despairing, to give them comfort and rest. No wonder Jesus Christ said, Come unto me, all you that labor and heavenly burden, and I shall give you An incredible awakening. And that's just the anticipation. That hasn't even happened yet in that, those pages. But you know, there's as much and amazing as those names are, when you put it together, there's one name that's even more amazing than all them. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Philippians 2.10, that at the name of Jesus, every name, every knee should bow, sorry, of those in heaven, of those on earth, and of those under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The question is this morning, have you bowed the knee? Have you bowed the knee to the great name of Yeshua? Jesus the Christ. Has your tongue confessed? You might even have the guilt moving on because it doesn't want to. Confess. Admit. Accept and receive that Jesus Christ is Lord. I tell you what, my Bible tells me that there is coming a day that this will happen. Every knee will bow. Right. And every tongue will confess. And it won't be a day of salvation. It will be a day of judgment. Common sense just says, now is the day of your salvation. Before judgment, before the time of salvation runs out, it would be a good idea to bow the knee today. It would be a good idea for your own safety. As you are going to stand before God, and I am going to stand before God, and if you haven't got a good lawyer standing next to you, you are going to be found guilty without Jesus Christ. Plain and simple. There will be no ifs or buts. There will be no excuses. There will be no good tricks like Donald Trump's lawyers or anything like that. They won't be available to any one of us. Our lawyer is Jesus Christ. He is called the Advocate. That is another name that's given. He is the one who is our defense. 
He defends us before the judgment of God. God says to Jesus Christ, what is this person done with you? 